Welcome to the D6 Family Ministry Podcast, a place where ideas, principles, and personalities come together to give you a ministry advantage that empowers the church and home. I don't know anything more important in our society or in the kingdom of God than to help the church help the family. Discipleship is not an event, it's a way of life. And one day it just hit me that discipleship at home was not about doing more. It was about inviting Christ into what we were already doing. The goal of family ministry is not families sitting on the couch, holding hands and singing Kumbaya. The ultimate goal is families that love God, love people and make disciples of all peoples. So that's why you're here. You're here to say one hour a week, as significant and as awesome as it is, we know that it's not enough and we want to be intentional with every hour. You're listening to the D6 Podcast. Here are your hosts, Marianne Howard, Ron Hunter, and Josh Wooten. Well, welcome everybody to the D6 Podcast. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us today and our guest today Jonathan Cronkite. I don't want to give away too much of his gold, but he has this illustration with prayer rocks that really, no pun intended, but rocked my world a little bit. It (laughs) was a great reminder of a way to uh, bring prayer and and make it palatable for your kids and and give you some kind of tactile uh, learning opportunity with your kids. And and so with that being said, is there something that you have done within your family in the context of your own house uh, to be able to bring prayer life or, or infuse prayer into your daily lives with your kids that has you've seen be very effective? Mm. So I don't know if you guys know this, but for a while, Chad was a missions pastor And um, he's got a real heart, missional heart. And one of the things that we did with our kids when they were younger, meaning like in the five, six, seven, eight year range, is we would check the tags of our shirts to see what country our, our clothing was made from. And we would do some research on that country and just, you know, looking into what are the needs there and those kinds of things. And we would pray for that country. And even to this day, my kids still think that's funny. And they come down and they're like, oh, Bangladesh, let's see if it's reached and how reached it is. And we have an app that we use that helps us kind of navigate that. But that really was a helpful thing. And now you guys know we're really big coffee snobs and we drink like very, very expensive coffee. And so we pay attention to where the beans are harvested and where we purchase our beans. A lot of our beans right now we're drinking are from Europe. And so that's just another one idea to maybe get your family praying missionally and thinking missionally is look at the tag, look at the country of the, the tag of the shirt you're wearing, look at the country that it was made in and pray for that country. Wow. I don't think we were that sophisticated when our kids were smaller. That is, that's brilliant. The only thing I can share is that whenever we began to pray, we would often remind them, you can't pray for self. You have to pray for other people's requests. So we weren't we weren't drinking coffee back then as a family and hadn't thought about the other connections. So we had the missionary prayer cards that would hang oftentimes on the, the fridge and, and we we would uh, remember them, but not not that as intentional as you as you guys have just done. Josh? Yeah, I had a friend who really um challenged me and we he had we went to his house during the Christmas season. And rather than having all of his Christmas cards just stacked up somewhere and finding a place to or a way to display them on the fridge, they had a special Christmas tree just for their Christmas cards that came in. And every night he and his family would take a family off of the Christmas tree and pray specifically for them. And then they would write him a little note, send a text and, and you know, let them know that, hey, we chose you tonight to pray. And I just thought that's a very mm-hmm, creative yeah. way to be able to bring that in because these people thought well enough for them to spend the 50 cents on a stamp and the cards and you made the list, you know, so you, you, it was a way to be able to reach back out and say, Hey, not only have we thought about that, but it got a lot of people praying for each other. It, it yeah. something we adopted with our Christmas tree. So that was a good way, easy, low hanging fruit as we call it uh, to, mm-hmm. to get kids praying. 
Well, I'm excited about this interview today. Jonathan Cronkite, he brings some practical ways to help families pray and be God aware. Really, yeah. that's really kind of his his whole thing is just bringing God awareness into the everyday, into your interactions with your kids, into your children's ministry. And so we're going to listen to his interview and then we're going to talk about it on the other side. Right now, I am joined by Jonathan Cronkite. Jonathan served in full-time ministry for over 23 years and is currently a real estate investor and founder of Homes Devoted. He and his wife, Carrie, are passionate about assisting church leaders and leading families who raise children who trust God. They speak at family retreats as well as lead workshops and parenting weekends. They've been married for 24 years and have five awesome kids. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. Um, It's good to be here. So I'm going to ask you a question because if I don't ask this, we're going to have listeners asking this and and then it'll be a whole thing. Right. But how often... It'll just save lots of time with the emails and Yeah, let's let's get out of the way. People want to know, are you related to Walter? Uh, Walter Cronkite. Now, uh, only certain age groups know who that is at this (laughs) point, just as a disclaimer. But um, yeah, I'm his grandson. Okay. I'm his grandson. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but I say that often. And, um, and they look at me and then I, you know, have to tell them the truth because I'm a pastor. So I'm trying to decide if, because I do know that if that makes me old or I just know history, I, I'm going to go with the latter. Uh, sure. The former. It, uh. You can, you can. <laughs> um, well, today we're talking about raising kids who know God is at work. Now in your breakout at the D6 conference, you discussed raising children who see God at work. What does it mean to see God at work? Okay, so I got to preface this with some scripture because it's really God's idea, and so I got to give him the credit. Mm -hmm. So in Joshua chapter 4, this is where Joshua is about to lead the people into the promised land, and they have to cross the Jordan. And in order to cross the Jordan, well, another miracle has got to happen. So this is what's so this is what's happening. Joshua chapter four, verse four. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel, and he told them, Go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder. So they're pretty big stones. Twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. This is where it gets good. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And then you tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. And these stones will stand as a memorial among the people of God forever. God gave them this idea to build a memorial so that they could then remind their kids for generations that God is at work, that God did this, that God is with us, that God cares, that, that God wants to bless. And that's why, we, that's why he followed us. That's why he's done all these things. And this is a reminder. So 15 to 12, 15 to 20 years ago, my wife and I came up with this idea of writing prayer requests on rocks. Hmm. So we call it prayer rocks and we just encourage families. And I love teaching and sharing about this because we've done this. So we know it works. So right now in our home, we've got a bowl full of rocks that we've got names and prayer requests on these rocks. And we use those as we pray together as a family pass them around, take some rocks, and those are tangible ways that we pray for people in in situations. And then when God answers those prayers, we have a memorial, we have a bowl, this two foot by one foot memorial dish platter in our living room full of rocks, which symbolize and remind our kids and us that God has been at work that God has done things. And so, you know, when our kids are 15, 18, leaving the home, 
they have constantly walked by reminders that God's been at work. I love that because I know some people, they will paint rocks and kind of put them around the community and things for people mm-hmm. to find. But this concept, it's similar, but it's deeper. And I, and I like this, this idea, this visual representation of being able to see how God is at work. And kind of going along with that, I'll admit that as an adult, sometimes I can be blind to what God is doing around me. I, I know God is at work around me, but sometimes I'm in my own head and I'm too busy to actually realize what God is doing. How can we make sure that our eyes are open to what God is doing around us? Well, that's a tough question and a tough thing, uh, a tough thing to do, but I think we need to be, we just, we need to remind ourselves. We, and you know, it's crazy as it sounds, but even post-it notes. But I think if we, as parents who want to lead our children to, to recognize when God's at work, we've got to ask ourselves, you know, how has God been at work? In the morning, we got to say, okay, God, how are you going to work in and through me today? Uh, at night, you know, laying in bed, God, how were you at work today? Um, in our quiet times when we're being still and knowing that God is with us, you know, God, and, and we just, we need to ask God's spirit to remind us um, and let us know how he's been at work. And I, I even praise God for the things that I don't recognize, right? We know God's at work and we don't recognize those things, but there are times that I'll just, God, thank you for the things I don't even know. Make me aware that you're at work. So I, why? So I can give you the honor and the praise. And so we got to do that with our kids. You know, um, my son just called me just a couple hours ago during the general session and he's in boot camp or just graduated from boot camp and he's in Texas. And, uh, he said, he said, dad, the, all the dorms are filled up at UCF and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was like, well, I wonder what God has planned. You know, because God's at work and we know God's, we, I know God is leading him and moving him. And we just got to keep asking those questions. Like, how is God going to work through this? And I love what you just said. I wonder what God is going to do. I, I think the natural inclination is to worry and to stress oh, about those things for and sure. say, what for am sure. I going to do? But you flipped that around and said, I wonder what God is going to do, expecting greatness. That's, that's such a shift in perspective. I'm thinking of my own life where I tend to go to the negative first and be the pessimist and freak out and worry. Totally. Uh, you know, I, I'm dealing with a, my car's at the mechanic right now. And that's where I've been, you know, oh, how much is this going to cost me and things like that, rather than looking to see how God is working through the situation. Uh, so you mentioned your son. Uh, I'm wondering how early in a child's life can we really start going through this? Like, when should we begin to start focusing on seeing God at work and what God can do through these situations? Well, I, I think you know, the first thing I'm reminded of is we've got a video that we show in our workshops of our 17-year-old son now, who was like a year and a half, you know, in his chair at dinner and um and we got this video where he's holding his hands and he's bowing his head and then we say amen and then he raises his hands in cheer and he says something like hey and so for a, for a long time in our family we would say amen raise our hands and cheer and so he's one and a half he he doesn't know what he's you know what we're doing you know so my point is they're going to model. They're going to work. They're going to take on what we model, and it can. It starts from the beginning. So even with mealtime prayers, or when we're doing prayer rocks and praying together as a family, we made sure that our little ones were even in the room with us, either sitting on the floor or playing with a toy. But they were part of what we were doing. So you know, as soon as they're, as soon as they can pray. They, they can, you know, they can do prayer rocks and be a part of family prayer time. Hmm. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're going to come back and keep talking to Jonathan about how to raise kids who know God is at work. Do you know someone on a pastoral or staff search committee who feels overwhelmed with the process or is getting worried about getting it wrong and wishes they had a roadmap? Look no further than the remarkable new book titled How to Find the Right Pastor. 
From National Ministry Leader Ron Hunter and nationally recognized Christian lawyer David Gibbs III, this invaluable handbook consists of 44 short, easy-to-read chapters, which will help teams navigate the intricacies of finding the perfect pastor or staff member, ensuring a successful and fulfilling leadership hire for years to come. The guide covers crucial areas such as defining search criteria, assessing leadership qualities, evaluating cultural fit, and conducting effective interviews. The guidance provided in these chapters, along with downloadable forms and evaluations, will equip search committees with the tools they need to make informed decisions and select the most suitable candidate. Pick up a copy of How to Find the Right Pastor and let these experts guide you through the process. Available now at d6family.com. We are back, and we're talking to Jonathan Cronkite about how to raise kids who know God is at work. Now, you've talked about prayer, and I know that prayer plays an important role in this. It can be a struggle to know how to pray with our kids. Can you walk us through what your family's prayer time looks like? Uh, I love this question because my wife and I love sharing about how we pray together as a family. So years ago, I'm sure it was my wife who came up with this acronym for PRAY. P-R-A-Y, and it stands for praise, repent, ask for others, and ask for yourself, the why. So real simple, and we to this day, with, with older teenagers and with our 10-year-old, this is our format for praying. We praise so even kids from a young age can, can fill in this blank. So we just say, okay, praise, God you are and then fill in the blank with an adjective. And we help our kids understand more adjectives than just, God, you're amazing. But it's awesome. So our kids just, all they have to say is one word, two words, God, you are, and fill in the blank. And so we we have done that from years and years and and still do it today, okay. So repent. Um, we need to humble ourselves, right? God, I mean, there's a, we want our kids to realize that their sin does cost something and did cost Jesus something. And so we just say, okay, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me for, and then they fill in the blank. Uh, ask for others. God, help me or help others, help grandma, help, you know, my friend. God help others. And the reason why we did this PRA the, the way that it is, is up to this point, it's all focused on other others. You know, P is praising God. And we want our kids to be others centered because it is so easy, right, for prayer time with the family to be all about us and all about me. And Lord, help me with my grades and help me with my friends and help me with my girlfriend and which college and which career. But, um, but we really want kids to be, grow up having an attitude of others and not being, you know, not being just all about ourselves. But why is, um, yeah, God help me. And God's concerned about our needs and their needs. And so, uh, so as a family, that's what we do. It's, it's very simple, very basic. Um, and it's just a great formula that we, uh, that we continue to use today. Mm, that's really good. Well, you mentioned the rocks that your family has used, which I, I love that concept. It's something that's going to stay with me. What are some other ways that we can help our kids know God is at work? Well, I, I think I'd mentioned this before, but, um, well, like in my conversation with Caleb just just a couple hours ago, we we've got to remind them. We gotta we gotta bring up the fact that God is at work. And see, you know, I was a youth and family pastor for 23 years, and the reality is, I just think kids are growing up in the church, and they're not walking away from God. They're not rebelling from God. I think they're rebelling from lukewarmness, which kind of makes God sick too. But you know, the we we want them to know God is at work. And so we've got to constantly bring up the fact that God is at work. And so how are we going to see him at work? And our, our, so are our kids expecting God to work? And that's what we want to help communicate. We want to raise kids who know God worked through scripture, but that he works today and he cares about 
what's going on in our lives today. And he wants to be involved today. He wants to help and bless and, and be a part of what's going on in our lives today. Well, I appreciate you sharing this. This has been a literal and figurative eye-opener, and it's been a challenge to me to be aware of what God is doing and to focus on that, not to get so stuck in my busyness and routine and daily life that I miss this, but to focus on what God is doing. And not only that, but to help my kids see what God is doing in life. I appreciate you. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing this and for being here today. Thanks a lot. It's been great. You know, I loved how he said kids model what they do after what they hear. And so (laughs) it's, it's funny when we hear the snarkiness in our kids, we're like, what do you, how, how come you're saying it that way? (laughs) All of a sudden the very uttering of those words, you realize where they're getting it from. I'm like, ouch, ouch. So convicting. And, and laying out those ground ground guidelines for how they pray and him working through that acronym love mm-hmm. to pray there mm-hmm. I've, I've heard various ones but this one is is uh very simple very easy to use and um here's here's the question i have for for you guys what's a prayer you heard your kids pray that just you still stands out in your mind mm-hmm. you just heard them pray for someone or something or in a certain moment that just yeah. kind of took you back yeah xander he battled with fear really bad when he was around four, there was just this awareness of the world and and fear, just had a hard time going to sleep, didn't want to go to sleep, you know, all those things. And we of course did the veggie tales, um, (laughs) where's God when I'm scared, you know, and you know, God is bigger than the boogeyman. I mean, you know, listen, it's, it's where we started. I will never forget. I will never forget. Every night, after we would leave his room, we would pray over him. We would leave his room. We would hear him voice his own prayer to God. And he would say, Jesus, take my fears. Jesus, take my fears. Don't let me down. (laughs) Don't let me down. That's what he would say. I mean, I just, it chokes me up just thinking about it. He just is just that little voice crying out to God, Jesus, take my fears. Jesus, take my fears. Don't let me down. I won't ever forget that, you know, and he's not going to. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, for me, it was when I remember Hannah was maybe four years old and she's 24 now, but Hannah, when she was about four years old, I had a migraine headache and I was laying in my bed and I felt her little hand go up under my little washcloth. And she yeah. said, thank you, Jesus, for healing my daddy's headache. That was it. And I promise you, my headache disappeared with the snap of a finger. Mm-hmm. And wow. I was shocked. You know who wasn't shocked by that? Hannah. (laughs) Because she had the faith of a child. Like she had heard us teach her these things that Jesus is a healer. He, one of the last, you know, commands he gave the disciples, go forth and lay hands on the sick and heal them in Jesus' name. And we would tell her these stories and she'd hear this and took it literally. And it worked. This child to this day, I will have her pray for my migraine headaches. Like it, wow. it is something that she saw God move in some big ways because she just knew he was going to do it. It was like, why are you acting surprised? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You know, we teach our kids to pray and it's kind of like what you just said, Josh. I'm always humbled when I hear my kids pray for me. You know, we're mm-hmm. supposed to be like that big, strong, don't need. And we pray over our kids. We teach our kids. But man, they give us some great lessons. They pray over us. And my daughter texted me back a prayer one time when I was tackling something really, really hard. And I was like, man, the phrase I used with her, I'll never forget this exchange. And this was um, this was nearly 10, 12 years ago, maybe, no, actually it's 13 years ago. I said, I said, baby, I'm 100% determined to do this but I'm only 50% confident I'm even capable of doing this. And Mm -hmm. she texted me back and she said, dad, God's got you. I'm praying for you. And she just prayed. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I printed out that text. I put it on a marker that's sitting in the, on the back of something in my office that nobody else would see, but I know it's there. And every time I look at that, I'm reminded of that prayer and that Mm -hmm. encouragement from her. It's powerful. Yeah, it truly, truly is.
I thought it was interesting. I don't know if you guys caught this and it was kind of, he said it a little bit in passing, but I think it's worthy to note. He said, you know, I think that, you know, in terms of rebellion and what kids are rebelling from, he says they're rebelling from lukewarmness. Did you guys catch Mm. that? And I just thought that was really interesting. Like, you know, he, and it fits right into what he's saying from a big picture standpoint is, you know, we've got to become communities of remembrance so that we're, we're all coming around each other to remember where God is present and and expect God to move. Like there needs to be an expectation for God to move. Um, And that just changes the, the dynamics in your family when there's just this constant God awareness or let's stop and pray. Let's ask God, let's check with God. When we're, when we're practicing, we're going to check with him. We're going to pray to him. We're going to ask him. We're going to declare who he is. I mean, that is just a good practice because I think that battles that lukewarm, that lukewarmness that can settle in sometimes. Yeah. They, they need to know that God cares and that he wants to be involved and we have to bring him into that conversation. Like when things are not, going well, one of the things I ask my kid is, what do you think God is trying to teach you in this season? You know, what do you, what do you think God wants you to learn from this? Not instead of, well, so-and-so didn't invite me and this person said this about me and whatever, you know, hey, let's put our God goggles on and what do you think he's trying to teach you here? And let's pray about this. And it, it's a game changer. It is. I, I have the same thing that you're saying, Josh, um, you know, in this, Jonathan talked about crossing the Jordan and putting stones of remembrance. Mm-hmm. And every time people see it, they remember God. And I'm reminded at the end of the Old Testament, Nehemiah, and I teach on this on a regular basis, Nehemiah 8, the men discovered the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Tents. And they went back to the priest and said, what is this? He said, well, we're supposed to build these tents, bring our families in it, and teach our kids about God's provision and involvement in the Hebrew children when they were leaving Egypt, heading to the promised land, and that he will do that in our lives. Yeah. And so often we teach the stories of the Bible, and we teach the God of the Bible, but we don't teach the God who's involved in the stories of our lives and directing us. And that's the whole point. Mm-hmm. Can we spot the God who's involved in our lives and what he wants us to do? And I do think it's a battle of the will that you've got to tell your mind, I will remember. The yes. devil wants us to forget. I mean, guys, I just, I can't say it strong enough. The enemy is doing everything he can to help keep, to m- cause us to forget God. <laughs> yes, He wins when we forget him, we forget where he's at work in the unseen ways. Yes, And so I just, you know, I, we've got to fight for our minds to remember. That's why yeah. he says, put them on the frontlets of your mind because yes. he knows that our tendency is to forget. And so we've got to keep God central, not peripheral, yes. central in the center where we can see. Anyway, yeah, I just I, I think it's important for us to remember that we've got a it's a battle of the mind. There is there is some discipline in keeping him in front of you and saying, I will remember my God. That's right. I was gonna say, I think that's a great segue into you know that battle of the mind that we're talking about next next week on on the podcast we have brian haynes yeah and he's going to be discussing his new book war in the wilderness and and examine some personal suffering and and it's it's really really powerful so i want to suggest that you be sure to set a reminder or subscribe to this podcast so you get the notification next week when this comes out because it is one that is powerful and yes. and I mean full with two L's at the end. Mm. It is full <laughs> of power. Yeah. That's right. We'll see you next week with Brian Haynes. You've been listening to the D6 Podcast. You can learn more about D6 at d6family.com.